conscious fries Fix our eyes, at times they're hypnotized By our wickedness and it's disguise If we can't see your beauty, fix our eyes Your glory shines, but it's eclipsed by Hey, how y'all doing? Uh, welcome to our uh, week uh, three of our uh, Bible study we're calling uh, Seven Miles to Emmaus And uh, we have as sort of our foundation uh, scripture uh, Luke uh, 24 beginning in verse 44. Now he, Jesus, said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all the things that are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, So it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for sins, for forgiveness of sins, would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending you the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power uh, from on high. Now, this is after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, and he's preparing his apostles to go out to all the nations and preach the gospel. And uh, he says this gospel begins in the Old Testament. Jesus began teaching his disciples how that all the Old Testament was about the gospel. And he began with Moses. And so we too will begin with Moses. Uh, last week we talked about the first lines that Moses wrote in Genesis 1-1 and how it teaches us that God is eternal and the creator of all things, but also that this gospel of Christ is eternal. That it actually began before anything was created. So um, the gospel not only goes back to the Old Testament, but it goes back before the Old Testament, before time, before creation, before this reality that we experience here. And now we'll go on to verses um, 2 through 5, the Genesis 1, 2 through 5, and I'm reading from the um, NASB. The Bible says, And the earth was formless and desolate emptiness, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. Now, we, uh, we talked about time in the last video and how the theory of evolution really depends on time, namely a lot of it. It needs a whole lot of time. Now, scientists tell us that the universe is made up of three basic elements, time, matter, and space. And I forgot to mention last time that the first verse of the Bible actually contains these three elements. In the beginning, there's time. God created time. God created the heavens. There's space. God created space. And the earth, there's matter. God created matter. Uh, so time, space, and matter here in this first verse. And this was written some 3,500 years before anyone knew that the universe consisted of these three elements. Now, as I said last week, I don't want to get off too much on these topics, evolution and all that, because I, I don't think Jesus did. But they do need to be addressed as sort of the, the elephant in the room. And again, we don't interpret the Bible to accommodate science. We interpret the Bible to accommodate the words of Christ, what he taught us. Uh, that said, we're not anti-science here. <laughs> we don't just automatically reject everything from science. And, and, and what is science anyway? You know, people talk about it like it's some force in the universe, some natural law or something. But science is merely the discovery of an interpretation of information. There is no science, in a sense. There are only scientists, those who gather information and then draw conclusions from that information. It's all based on uh, the conclusions of people. Now, can people be wrong? <laughs> of course they can. Just ask Christopher Columbus. Every scientist of his day told him if he sailed too far that way, he'd fall off the edge of the earth. Man is fallible. God is infallible. Therefore, we only believe the conclusions of men when they do not contradict the words of God. And God does not come to conclusions, you see. He is, as we learned last week, the author of reality. So we don't just automatically reject every scientific conclusion, but we do automatically reject every scientific conclusion that disagrees with the fact of God's word. Um, now, back to the text. 
Well, there are some who believe that Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's like a summary statement or an introduction to the creative acts of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And here's how he did it, beginning in verse 2. There are some who believe that the creative act began in verse 1. God created the heavens and the earth. That was his first act. And then he went on to act 2 and act 3 and act 4 and so on. With either of these, we're left with the question, how much time elapsed between verse 1 and verse 2? Verse 1 says, God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. Verse 2, and the earth was formless and desolate emptiness, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. The words used to describe the condition of the earth immediately following verse 1 are, are confusion, uh, unreality, emptiness. It sounds like what the scientists say was the original condition of the earth, doesn't it? Like a wild, confused volcanic mess erupting and all that. So how long was the earth like that? Well, we don't know because we haven't been we haven't gotten to the light yet, but we will. But for now, all I'm saying is this could accommodate for an old earth creation, not for evolution, but only as regarding to the age of the earth, the rocks and the dirt that we walk on. Now, I'm not saying it does. I'm just saying it could. But as we said, this text was not written to teach us science. It was not even primarily written to give us an account of creation. It was written to bring us to Christ. Paul said in Galatians 3.24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Before we say Paul was only talking about the laws given at Sinai, Paul was making an argument from Genesis in the book of, of Galatians. So I'm only saying that to say that... Um, there is some wiggle room that someone might say, make a reasonable argument that uh, a lot of time passed between verse 1 and verse 2. And I'm not saying yes or no, I'm just saying something to consider. So verse 2 says, And the earth was a formless and desolate emptiness, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. This is the first creative act of God, to create a formless and desolate emptiness. And it was created that way for a reason. To teach us something of Christ. What does it teach us? Let's read on. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So the earth was this violent, confused place that was covered by darkness and also by water. Now th this would have been a terrifying image to the ancient people of that day. To them there was nothing quite as horrible as darkness and the sea. I mean, think about it. I mean, we think we know darkness, but we don't really. Their darkness would have been really, really dark, with no artificial light. Um, they could do nothing in the darkness. They could not work. They could not travel. They were completely vulnerable in the darkness. That's why all they could do was sit in their houses and wait for the darkness to pass. Darkness was chaos. Darkness was confusion. Darkness was mystery. Darkness was terrifying because you did not know what was in it. All throughout the Old Testament, we read of man's terror of the darkness. Proverbs 4.19, the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. Isaiah 8.22, and they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Psalm 82.5, they have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Joel 2.2, 2, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness there spread upon the mountains of great and powerful people. Their like has never been seen before, nor ever, ever again after them, the years of all the generations. Uh, this is not only talking about the fear of darkness, but this people that, this terrifying people that live in the darkness, this terrifying darkness is terrifying to these people. Jeremiah 13, 16, give glory to the Lord your God before he brings darkness, before your feet stumbles on the twilight mountains. And while you look for light, he turns it into gloom and makes it deep darkness. Amos 5, 18, woe to you who desire for the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. Proverbs 20, 20, if one curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in utter darkness. Amos again, Amos 8, 9, and on that day declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Uh, 1 Samuel 2, 9, he will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. Lamentations uh, uh, 3.20, he has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Darkness was terrifying to these people. 
And here Moses says this was the earth, this dark, terrifying, mysterious, and deadly place. And yet the Spirit of the Lord was hovering over it. Now here in this verse we're introduced to who we call the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. And what do we know about him? Well, we know from verse 1 that God is eternal. And being eternal, he must exist outside of his creation. Otherwise, he would have had to create himself, right? God's creation is outside of himself. We're not pantheists who believe that God is sort of infused into creation. But the, the, he is utterly separate from his creation. He is utterly holy from his creation, completely set apart from it. However, here we see the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the water. So we d deduce from this that God, though separate from his creation, interacts with his creation through the agency of his Holy Spirit. We'll, uh, we'll get into that more as the text uh, progresses. But what we can take from this is that God is actively participating within his creation while at the same time being completely separate from his creation. And he does this through the agency or mediation of the Holy Spirit. Now, this completely shatters the beliefs of deists like Thomas Jefferson, who believe that God was completely separate from his creation and as such, for the most part, indifferent to his creation. That he created it and then said, all right, good luck with all that. No, he actively participates in what he created, but not to the extent that, that the Buddhists believe that he is in all of creation. God is a God who participates in his creation, but is at the same time separate from his creation. And what is the first act? What is the first thing he does to his creation? What is the first thing he does when he sees this dark, violent, confused place? Verse 3, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Then God said, and here's where we get into trouble. Now we know from this that God is eternal, and he is at this point, one God in two, uh, the God who is separate and the God who is involved. Uh, and we also learn that he is a God who speaks. Well, what is meant by speak? Now, the word of faith people say, see there, there's power in your words. You speak faith words to the nothing and then things pop up in the nothing. Well, first of all, does God speak in the sense that, that we speak? When we speak, we emit sounds from our mouths that are formed into words or symbols of abstract propositions, propositions of truth. But, you know, getting off into deep waters here. But, but, but we do know that God speaks audibly. There are instances when his voice thundered from heaven and the people heard it and understood it. In fact, in Exodus at uh, Sinai, God spoke and it terrified the people, so much so that they cried out to Moses and begged him, please tell God not to speak to us anymore lest we die. But what does it mean here in Genesis when it says God said? Well, first of all, who or what was he talking to? Was he speaking to creation? Does God have a habit of talking to inanimate objects? Speech is communication between two parties, right? I mean, it's communication. God was speaking to someone. Who was he speaking to? Well, at this time, there was only one other person in creation from what we know, and that was the Spirit. And so from that, we conclude that God said to the Spirit, let there be light, and there was light. So, so it is not faith that is the agent of creation, but the Spirit of God. God, who is outside of creation, says to the Spirit, who is in creation, let there be light, and there was light. But we'll talk about that uh, more later. So, uh, where are we? Okay, verse 4. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. The light was good. And it would have certainly seemed good to the folks in the ancient world who were hearing this. Here is darkness, chaos, violence, mystery, confusion. And then comes light, then comes order, then comes understanding, then comes safety. So in the beginning there was darkness, chaos, confusion, mystery, violence. And God through his Holy Spirit brings order, truth, understanding, and safely, uh, safety. I think we can see the gospel implications here. And we can get an idea of what Jesus meant when he said in John eight twelve, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the life of light. Now, the people uh, listening to Jesus would have immediately considered creation and all their terrors and apprehensions and fear of darkness. And they would have remembered all the Old Testament passages concerning rescue from darkness, such as 
Isaiah 9, 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. In Psalm 18, 28, for it is you who light my lamp. The Lord my God lightens my darkness. Isaiah 50, 10, who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Isaiah 42, 16, and I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know, and paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. And then Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Then when we read on uh, in Genesis, uh, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. And so for here, here we have for the first time in the creation account, a separation and a naming. God distinguishes two things from each other. He separates light from darkness. He separates night from day. And, and with that in mind, I want us to turn to John chapter 9, because I believe in reading what John wrote in that chapter, John being one of those taught by Jesus in Luke 24, how to interpret the Old Testament, I think we can see how this passage in Genesis brings us to Christ. Uh, John chapter 9. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man who had been blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Now, to the disciples' way of thinking, this would have been the worst possible world for a man to have to live in, a world of utter darkness all the time, a world with no light, no day, only night, only confusion, only mystery, only fear. Something so terrible must have been brought on himself, right? Well, verse 3, Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. The works of God, Jesus says. The creation account in Genesis is a testament to the works of God. Creation itself is a testament to the works of God, Romans 1. Now this poor blind beggar is about to become a testament to the works of God, but now a very specific work. Verse 4, Jesus says, We must carry out the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. While I, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So this kind of harkens back to Genesis 1, right? Day and night. While Jesus was here, there was no night. He came to speak the words of God to us, to give us light. And everything he said was light. But he would be leaving soon. Soon it would be night again. Soon it would be darkness again. Uh, we'll get into that later. Uh, I realize I'm leaving a lot of questions unanswered, a lot of uh, elephants in the room, so to speak. Uh, but they'll be answered as we continue to read God's revelation. I want to let it unfold as, as it was intended to uh, unfold. When he had said this, he spit on the ground and made mud from the saliva and applied the mud to his eyes. He made mud from the earth, from creation. I believe this is a direct reference back to creation. I believe this is to make our minds go back to the account of creation. And said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. Sent, as in one sent. As in the Holy Spirit was sent into creation to bring light? Perhaps. And the blind beggar receives his sight. He receives light in his darkness. Now, we won't get into what happens next. There's a section there about how the blind man is brought before the leaders of the temple, and they keep asking him, who did this to you? And the blind man keeps answering, I don't know. He must be some kind of prophet, but I don't know who he is. I only know that I was blind, and now I see. And the leaders of the temple throw him out of the temple. On down to verse 35, Jesus heard that they had put him out, and upon finding him, Jesus heard that he had been cast out of the temple, and Jesus sought him out, and Jesus said to him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered by saying, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? The man had received his sight physically, but not spiritually. Many times we just assume that everyone Jesus healed was converted. Like there's a man who can't walk, Jesus heals him, and the man is converted and begins following Jesus. But this is not the case. The vast majority of those Jesus healed did not follow him. Uh, they, they remain lame in that sense. They're, they're cured of their physical infirmity, but they still have spiritual lameness and so on. They're cured of their physical blindness, but they still have darkness. 
as this man still had darkness. But again, Jesus does not leave this man in his darkness, just as God did not leave the earth in its darkness. Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking to you. And the man said, I believe, Lord. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, uh, verse 39, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Now those who were with him from the Pharisees heard these things and said to him, We are not blind too, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. This is reminiscent of uh, Jeremiah chapter 50, verses 20 through 22, where Jeremiah says, Declare this in the house of Jacob and proclaim it in Judah, saying, Hear this now, O foolish people, without understanding, who have eyes and see not, and who have ears and hear not. Do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence? Who have placed the sand as the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass beyond it? And though its waves toss to and fro, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. It harkens back to creation. This blindness of, of the religious leaders of Jerusalem harkens back to creation. And in creation here, in the first five verses, we see already a kind of blueprint for the gospel, how it works, what it means. We are a people ruled by darkness, the darkness of sin. And the darkness of sin produces confusion. It produces chaos. It produces fear. It produces violence. It kills us in the end. Such is this darkness. And we cannot rescue ourselves from it. The blind cannot lead the blind. They cannot even lead themselves. It's going to have to take a creative act of God. God is going to have to come to us and bring light just as he did in creation. The spirit hovered over the face of the darkness, so he hovers in a sense over us and gives to us light, light of understanding, light of order, light of life in the face of Christ Jesus. The gospel already right here in the first opening verses of Genesis. And that should bring uh, courage and, and faith to us to know that this gospel of Christ was not just something that Jesus just popped into the world uh, that he made up, uh, which, you know, the, the, the naysayers say, you know, Jesus just kind of came and came up with this thing and, and people believed it and, uh, you know, it just kind of became a movement and, uh, you know, just kind of caught on. It was really just something this man Jesus came up with. But when we study the Old Testament, we find that it's right there in the first verses. And even beyond that, it's before creation and that should give us hope and courage and faith that our faith is an eternal faith uh, it is placed in an eternal god it is placed in an eternal act uh, it is in eternity our faith is in eternity and uh, eternity past eternity present eternity future we are safe in christ christ is eternal his gospel is eternal the faith that he has given us is eternal, and we are safe in him. So anyway, I hope that was uh, that was beneficial. Uh, you know, next week we'll talk about the sea. Uh, remember, we said uh, two things terrified the ancient people: darkness and the sea. And we see in these first few verses that the earth was originally a place of both darkness and the sea. So uh, tune into that. I can't wait. God bless y'all, and uh, I'll talk to you again soon. Written more with gladness than Jesus, and fix their eyes on him. He endured the cross and died for sin. Long to Jesus, and fix their eyes on him. He too were crucified to die to sin. Now look to Jesus, and fix their eyes on him. He died only to rise again to joy. Now look to Jesus, and fix your eyes on him. Abide in his love, let his word abide within. Yo, this is